Hi. We're, we're approaching the end of the event. I know people are tired. Um, so I will keep this within my time limit here. Uh, I wanted to thank the Asian American Alliance of Marin for inviting me. Um, thank you for every for setting for setting me up. Um, and thank you everyone for attending today. My name is Michael Young. I was born and raised in San Francisco and actually spent half of my childhood here in Marin County. Are there any school teachers in the room? Any school teachers? Former. Former? Thank you. Thank you. Um, having gone to school in Marin really changed my life. And that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Even though now I live in San Francisco, a part of my heart still belongs in Marin County. I'm gonna start with kind of my family story, a little bit story about Marin County, and a little bit story about how discrimination reaches the very highest levels of our society to the very top of our, gov of our government. My, both my grandfathers were generals in the Chinese Nationalist Army. So they fought the Japanese and they fought the communists. They refugee to Taiwan after they lost to the communists. My parents grew up in Taiwan. And in the late 70s, after the liberalization of immigration policy, my parents immigrated to America. I was born in San Francisco in 1973. In 1977, we were fortunate enough to move to Marin County. So basically, the arc of the story is that the empires in Asia have clashed. American foreign policy had a direct hand in what happened. That is what brought my parents here. A lot of us came because of American foreign policy that happens overseas. So we're not, we didn't just show up for no reason. We showed up because we we're a result of empires clashing. I spent seven years here, here in Marin County from four to 11 years old. I went to Bel Air, Granada, uh, Tam Valley, Strawberry Point Elementary School. Um, I received a fantastic education. <coughs> I can't tell you how deeply grateful I am to have gone to, have gone to school in Marin. That being said, I was also a target of bullying. Our house was vandalized because we were Asian. It toughened me up. I learned how to stand up for myself. I learned how to engage mainstream society. I wasn't scared of being around white people anymore because I knew that I could perform just as well as they could, and in fact, sometimes even better. And that is exactly what got me into trouble. When I got the A, but then the white kid next to me got a B in English, humiliating, of course. And so I learned how to keep my head down and to hold back. I learned how to hide. Despite that, we moved back to San Francisco in sixth grade, and immediately, because of the fantastic education here in Marin County, I went straight into honors courses. I did very well at middle school. I went on to Lowell, I went on to Berkeley, and then I went on to Harvard. From there, I wasn't done fighting, because I could sense that what happened here in Marin County was happening all around the country. And there was, I had to find some way of manifesting myself as, as an equal citizen in this country. So after Harvard, I bounced around a little bit, and on September 7, 2001, I signed my Army enlistment contract. September 8, September 9, September 10, September 11, 2001, I thought to myself, oh, F me, what did I get myself into? I spent the next 10 years from 2001 all the way through 2014 as an Army reservist. And in 2003, I got the call to be an American diplomat. So I ended up going to the State Department, and I served faithfully and with distinction for 10 years, first in South Korea, and then Afghanistan, and then Vietnam, and then Pakistan. I was there when we assassinated bin Laden. And then I came back to Washington, D.C. for two years in the Bureau of Counterterrorism to negotiate bilateral agreements with foreign countries to share terrorist identities information. So my entire career as a diplomat and as an Army Reserve officer was really engaged in the war on terror. The funny thing was, the State Department hired me because I speak Mandarin. We don't have enough 
Mandarin speaking Americans to staff our US posts in Beijing, Shenyang, Guangzhou, Shanghai. And now I think we have one in Wuhan also. They hired me to go to China, but once I got in, they wouldn't let me serve. I applied for Beijing, and at first they said, okay, great, you can work at the embassy there. And then a few months later, they called me and said, actually, you can't go. And I said, well, why? They said, well, the security bureau decided that it's not a good fit for you. They never put anything in writing. So instead of going from Korea to Beijing, I had to go to Afghanistan. Happy to do so. I join, I volunteer, I love this country. I will fight on the front lines for it. Not a big deal. Well, I thought, okay, this is a little bit weird, because they hired me because I speak Mandarin, but they won't let me serve in China. And then I found out I wasn't the only one. There are a lot of other Chinese Americans who also were not allowed to serve in their presumed country's origin. There were some that couldn't serve in Taiwan, some that couldn't serve in Malaysia, some that couldn't serve in Hong Kong. In fact, there was a Chinese American, they wouldn't even allow him to serve on the China desk in Washington, D.C for basically presumed disloyalty. The line that was given was, oh Michael, we would never do that to you. We would never put you in that situation where you're among all these Chinese people who are gonna to come to you and try to influence you to pull American secrets out of you and divide your loyalties. That was the message that was given to me. So, okay, being a hardworking Asian, kept my head down, I just kept pumping, just keep working, keep working hard. I got to, uh, got to Pakistan, another danger area. So I figured, okay, not only am I a U.S. Army infantry officer in the reserve, but I've also been to Afghanistan, I've also been to Pakistan. I think I've proven myself. So I applied a second time for China, this time to Guangzhou. And again, at first they said, sure, you can go. And then again, a few months later, the call came in and said, you can't go. And again, they didn't put anything in writing. At this point, I was livid, I was angry. My whole life was fighting against the bullying and the discrimination that I felt here in Marin County. I brought it all the way to Washington, D.C., and I still was not treated as an equal. So I figured, okay, then I'm gonna go back to Washington, D.C., get a job in the building, and then fight this fight to try to get other Chinese Americans also to have them stop discriminating against us, basically. Well, to make a long story short, upon that second denial of my application to China, I came back to the department and I started surveying all the other Asian American diplomats. Well, it turns out 20, there were more than 20, but 20 were willing to talk to me. And the majority of them were Chinese American. There was one Korean American, there was one Vietnamese American, but pretty much everyone else was Chinese American. And a lot of them also there wasn't anything in writing that they could appeal. So it was this weird black box. We prepared the paper, when I say we, me and some of my colleagues, we prepared the policy papers, we, we prepared what we were gonna say, we shot this all the way up the line, like, you know, like a good rule follower, we shot this up the line to Secretary Clinton, sec sorry, Secretary Kerry first, and then Secretary Clinton. They noticed, but they didn't really take action because at the time, it just wasn't something that was high in people's minds. This is 2011, uh, 2012, sorry, 2013. I talked to other Asian Americans in the department. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They didn't want to get in trouble. They wanted to keep their head down and just keep pumping away. They didn't want to rock the boat. And I told people, look, if you don't stick your neck out, it's always going to be like this for us. You have to be willing to fight. You have to be willing to bleed. You have to be willing to lose. So I decided, fine, forget it. I'm going to go to the Washington Post because no one else is listening. Luckily, an appointee under Hillary Clinton, she was, she was the press advisor for the entire State Department. She saw the story. She authorized me to go on, on record. So they're, they're, when you think of political appointees, political appointees do have their use in the federal government. Because had it been a regular you know, career diplomat, they probably would not have given me the, the clearance. Gave me the clearance, I talked to the Washington Post, the first story dropped in 2013. After that story came out, 
We were all waiting on pins and needles. We were waiting for, am I going to get a call from the security bureau? Are they going to come arrest me? Are they going to fire me? Are they going to investigate me? We were all so nervous. <coughs> well, nothing happened. No one said anything. And I thought, you know what? I guess people just don't care. So in 2013, I decided I had enough after 10 years of fighting this, and I left the State Department. Because I wanted to fight this from the outside, and I wanted to go off on my own. In 2016, someone on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee saw the Washington Post article. That person was also Asian American, South Asian American. And they looked at the article and they said, this is crazy. They called their friend, another Asian American diplomat, who I happen to know, and we were able to get on a meeting with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. They inserted a provision in the State Appropriations Bill to require the State Department to basically set up some sort of auditing process for this, some sort of appeals process. I shared that story because it's not enough just to come out and speak up. It's important to get it documented. It's important to get it in the media. It's important to show your face and be willing to get hit. Because without that media article, that Senate Foreign Relations Bill would never have passed. They would never have seen it. That was back in 2015, 16, so that was an incremental, but it wasn't enough because the security bureau in the State Department basically wrote a piece of paper saying, yes, 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 we're doing it, sent it to Capitol Hill and thought that that was gonna be good enough. Well, it wasn't. During the whole time from then until now, I would get calls from Asian American diplomats saying, they're not letting me serve. They think I'm being disloyal. I mean, I had, I had diplomats in tears on the phone. They didn't know where else to turn and they were afraid to speak up because they were afraid of losing their jobs and I totally get it. You got a wife and kids at home or a husband and kids and you, you need to take care of them. I totally get it. And then George Floyd happened. And then all of a sudden, the Asian American Civil Rights Renaissance resurrected. 2020, 2019, 2021, it coincided with COVID. All of a sudden we were able, we had a, we had a way to talk about how, what our experience was in this country. And because of that Washington Post article, CNN called me. Because CNN was looking for stories. They were trying to compete with other, other news organizations about anti-Asian discrimination. So again, Having that media story was so critical because 10 years later, I got the call from CNN. I went live on, on camera and I talked about my experience. That interview dislodged something in Capitol Hill again. Uh, Congressman Ted Lieu caught wind of it. And him, along with Congressman Andy Kim, Korean American, also former U.S. diplomat, now a congressman in New Jersey, he also was not allowed to serve in Korea for presumed disloyalty. Those two got together and they submitted another bill in Congress to force the State Department again to put more mechanisms in place to protect Asian American diplomats. Now that bill is passed, the department is still pushing back, they're still, they're still want, they, they don't want to release the numbers, although we've asked for them. But the good thing though is that a year or two after Ted Lieu's bill, this is about four months ago, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken came out and said, okay, well, we're, we are rescinding all new, what they call assignment restrictions. It means we're not gonna restrict Asian American diplomats anymore from serving in those countries. But the mechanism of review is still in place, so they still reserve the right to not allow you to serve in, those, in either China or wherever they think you're from. That's kind of a broad brush of what's happening in the State Department. I met with the White House National Security Council a few weeks ago. This is on the president's radar, but it's still a lot more work that we have to do. In July, I will be flying to Washington, D.C. to present at the OCA National Conference, again, on this issue. We're finding out that it's not just in the State Department, it's also in the FBI. So we have Muslim Americans and we have Chinese Americans in the FBI that are being targeted and discriminated against. We also know what's happening in the Department of Commerce, Sherry Chen, as you know the story. Uh, we also have discrimination happening in the intelligence community. You know, DOD, NSA, DIA, all those three-letter alphabets, CIA, all of them. It's happening all within the federal government. 
the reason why I want to talk about this and I, and I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about it is because the government is actually the community. The only difference between the government and us is that the government employees are paid full time to take care of the community. If we can't get the government right, then we're probably not going to be able to get society right. If we can get proper and equal treatment within the government, that becomes an example for the rest of us to follow. This fight is not over. All this discrimination that we feel on a daily basis or weekly or monthly, however you feel it, it's being manifested in different ways at different levels of society. And today, I just wanted to share my story about how it's manifesting itself on the federal level. So if you ever do talk to Jared Huffman, let him know that he's able to take a stand on this because I will be in Washington, D.C. with a bill asking him to support it. Yeah, I think that's my story. Just to link it from beginning to end, thank you, Marin County, for giving me the education to be able to take this fight to Washington, D.C. effectively. It's because of Marin County that I'm able to actually be successful in the county. Thank you. the next speaker so if you want to talk to me I'll be I'll hang out after the presentation okay thank, thank you so much you.